It's no secret that Nintendo is really down to give games sequels. However, Nintendo has often made sequels before that just don't hold up compared to their predecessors. It's not that the game is bad, because it's very rare that Nintendo actually releases a bad game. A bad game for Nintendo usually means it's just something that ended up being underwhelming. Back in 2017, when Splatoon 2 launched, the fans were left rightfully wondering if Splatoon 2 was really going to be a good sequel to Splatoon 1. So in today's video, we're going to determine if Splatoon 2 was truly worthy to call itself a sequel. Splatoon 2 has often gotten the nasty nickname of Splatoon 1.5. Me personally, I never really believed that. Not until recently. For those who don't know, I picked up Splatoon 2 in 2018, as I never had a Wii U. But I'd remember seeing the first reveal of Splatoon all the way back in 2014. I was taken back by what I had seen there. I believe Nintendo to be incapable of really blowing gamers away anymore because of the Wii U era, until I saw Splatoon. Finally, a new take on the shooter, a very necessary new take, as shooters had really gotten borderline identical. Of course, Splatoon didn't save the Wii U. Splatoon 1 sold a bit over 2 million units, which is actually very good for Wii U numbers. Before I'd like to continue, I'd like everyone to know that I love Splatoon 2. It is my favorite game of all time, and it's why my channel exists today. But regardless of my or your feelings, I'd like to look at it objectively, or as objectively as I can, and if we can really call Splatoon 2 a good sequel to Splatoon 1. So, the way I plan to determine this is by breaking down all game modes and categorizing and finding out what it does better than Splatoon 1 and how it makes itself stand out. Also, I just want to note, just because something's different doesn't mean it's not good. But if Nintendo wants to call this Splatoon 2 and not Splatoon Deluxe, then they need to show that it's different. Also, before we get into this video, some of the gameplay you'll be seeing in this video belongs to members of the community and their links will be in the description below. But that's enough pretext, let's jump into the story mode. So, right off the bat, it's very important to note that both Hero Mode campaigns really exist to be a tutorial and that is prevalent in the no-brainer dialogue that Cuttlefish gives you in Splatoon 1 and Marie gives you in Splatoon 2. It's no secret that these two modes don't really differentiate from each other, and examples of these two modes reusing the same gimmicks are everywhere. For example, this part of the level where you need to pop a blowfish to ink the whole wall in Splatoon 1 is also used in Splatoon 2. Like, they copy these little blowfish challenges a few times, actually. Splatoon 2 doesn't copy everything, however. Octoballs are a Splatoon 1 exclusive enemy that you can only splat by getting them first to roll around in your ink. Splatoon 2 also has its own exclusive enemy called the Tentacook. Which, I should add, is very much inferior to the Octoball in just about every way, because the only challenge the Tentacook ends up being to the player is the fact that when they slightly notice anything, they run away. And when these enemies have the keys to the puzzles you need to keep going, forces an interaction with them, and I'd like to say it leads to some good puzzle solving skills on how to block their exits, but there aren't any to find here. The Tentacook runs so fast that throwing a bomb on one end and trying to catch it through the other hardly ever works, so these enemies really just turned out being luck based things. Squeegees are actually an enemy type that's almost good when Splatoon 2 ported it over. In Splatoon 1, they're relatively harmless with how easy it is to get around them, but in Splatoon 2, they are much more likely to find you and start hunting you down. Also in Splatoon 2, the Jumbo Squeegee missions are a lot of fun when the squeegees are control right, that is. As for actual story in these story modes, it is very bland. The plot of Splatoon 1 is that the Great Zapfish, which is the Inkling's source of power, is stolen by the Octarians, and Agent 3, who is your playable Inkling, must save it. The plot of Splatoon 2 is the exact same thing. Also, you have to save Kali as well, but they may as well be the exact same thing because the modes play the exact same way. Super linear campaigns, find Tea Kettle, shoot Tea Kettle, jump in Tea Kettle, beat level, repeat around 25 times. The levels are fun, however, and if story is just a tiny little afterthought to you, then you're going to have a really fun time playing Splatoon 2's campaigns. Every boss battle besides the final boss starts up the same way, with the tentacle grabbing a zapfish and rising from the ground. When it comes to boss fights in Splatoon 1, they're relatively easy, except for the Octavio boss battle, which I'll get into in a little bit. But I chose Octostop to show for the background to call out a serious issue. This boss has been reused two other times. 
once in Hero Mode 1, once in Splatoon 2, and then once in Octo Expansion. It was original in the first game and shows up two more times in Splatoon 2. They do a little different every time with Octo Stomp, but they're still reusing almost the same boss battle over and over again, and it is not right. We are paying for something new, not Octo Stomp 45. Playing wise, all boss battles happen in a big wide open circular arena, except for the Octavio boss battle in Splatoon 1. Octavio in Splatoon 1 is the only boss battle in both hero modes to not just have an open pad with the occasional small tower in it. It's also important to note just how short the boss battles are. They last like maybe 2-3 to three minutes, maybe 5 minutes max if it's your first time. The gameplay you're watching is the first time I'm fighting the Octostomp 1 ever. The boss battles are super easy to figure out and take absolutely no time to complete. Same goes for Splatoon 2's boss battles. However, I do think Splatoon 2 does have better boss battles. They're more elaborate, like the Octo Samurai and the Octo Shower. I really like the concept of the Octo Shower and the design of the Octo Samurai. But, to conclude our discussions on bosses, we have to talk about the DJ Octavio boss battles. I have zero clue how Nintendo managed to mess up the DJ Octavio battle in Splatoon 2 so much considering they nailed the first Octavio battle in Splatoon 1. So, Splatoon 1's Octavio battle has you jumping from platform to platform, chasing the Octobot King. And in Splatoon 2, the game just drops you into a big circle, and you start kicking Octavio's ass. It seriously has no challenge to it at all. However, there's gotta be some witchcraft Nintendo's pulling off here, because the Splatoon 2 Octavio fight is so much fun to replay. Whereas playing the first Octavio battle more than once just gets so freaking boring. I can't tell you why this is at all, but all I can tell you is if I had to pick one right now to play, it would be Octavio 2. So, the boss has definitely got an improvement in Splatoon 2. However, I really don't consider a boss battle to be a good boss battle when you can beat said boss in like 2 minutes. However, that doesn't mean I can't say that Splatoon 2 didn't take a good step in improving bosses. So, overall, for campaigns, I'm gonna have to say that Splatoon 2 did it better. However, that is by a small, small margin, because these campaigns are really not that good. I don't plan on talking about every difference in returning weapons to Splatoon 2, but I will talk about the notable changes. Rollers now have a vertical flick, making them able to reach even further. The Brella is a new class of weapon that opens up an umbrella that shields you from enemy ink while basically firing like a shotgun with little ink pellets that shoot out all the time. Some shoot lots of ink pellets really fast, and some don't fire off their umbrella. Some fire one shot and shoot off pretty fast, some shoot really slow and have a hard to break umbrella that shoots off. Finally, the biggest addition were the splat dualies. There's a few types of dualies. Dapple dualies shoot low range but give you like 5 dodge rolls. Normal dualies have fire medium range and two rolls. Gluga dualies shoot slow, but when you roll you get really extended range. Finally, dually squelchers, which fire really far, have a really weird dodge roll that lets you slide a little after you do said dodge roll. These aren't even all of the dualies, there's even more than this. Those are just the ones I'm talking about right now. Splatoon 2 improved on ideas like the dual squelchers from Splatoon 1. And even though there weren't a whole ton of new weapon classes added, they really fleshed out the weapon classes that they did add with a flavor of each new weapon for everyone. For example, I like the Undercover Brella because it shoots faster and offers a more constant shielding. I like the Normal Duelies because of how balanced they are. I'd also like to note that after both games' final updates, Splatoon 1 had a total of 90 different weapon kits, whereas Splatoon 2 had 139 weapon kits. 143 if you count Grizzco weapons. So in terms of the main weapon department slash weapon kit department, Splatoon 2 passes Splatoon 1 by a long shot. Splatoon 1 had 7 special weapons by the end of its life. Actually, I think that's all it ever had. I don't believe Splatoon 1 ever had more special weapons added to it like Splatoon 2 did. Splatoon 1's special weapons were the bomb launcher. Nothing special to see here, just you throwing bombs until your special runs out. The special is basically the same thing as Bomb Launcher in Splatoon 2, only difference is that the bomb you launch in Splatoon 1 is your sub-weapon, whereas in Splatoon 2 the bomb launcher is different. But hey, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
The bubbler, while using the special, makes you immune to damage for a short period of time. There was really no way to balance the bubbler without changing the entire way that it worked due to its purpose. The Echo Locator lets you and all of your teammates know where every enemy player is on the map. The special was later turned into a sub-weapon in Splatoon 2 that was turned into an area of effect sub-weapon. The Ink Strike, my personal favorite Splatoon 1 special weapon, lets you use the gamepad to shoot a huge missile of ink from using the gamepad to shoot the missile. I'm really not sure why the special couldn't have returned to Splatoon 2 with maybe like a smaller missile, but if I had to guess why, it's because Nintendo didn't know how to make the Ink Strike work without the gamepad. The Ink Zooka is a very simple special weapon, which is probably why it's returning in Splatoon 3. Basically, you just fire missiles until your special runs out. I think the special was considered overpowered due to just how many times you could fire the Ink Zooka. The Killer Whale was a speaker that sends out a giant line of sound that if the enemy inkling is caught in it, it would splat them. Nintendo kinda tested bringing this weapon back in Splatoon 2 in the MC Princess Diaries map with the inclusion of the Princess Cannon. The Kraken makes you invincible, and in this period, you can one-hit melee kill your enemies. The whole invincibility thing was probably what made Nintendo want to remove these specials in Splatoon 2. Splatoon 1 special weapons definitely had a problem of being way too overpowered, with the special weapons considering they had two invincibility specials. Also, most of these specials were done on a duration rather than having a few shots. You just fire these weapons or spam ZR with the Kraken until the special meter is empty. Splatoon 2 made specials a bit differently. Rather than just letting the special go off a duration, most specials now have a limited number of uses. These are the Splatoon 2 specials and how they differ. The Tenno missiles allow you to lock onto one to four targets. When locked onto one target, it fires ten missiles. At two targets, it's five, and three to four, it's four each. It really is easy to dodge the missiles from the Tenno missiles, however, after firing the missiles, you get a temporary echo locator effect left on the enemies, which you can use to track them down and probably do more damage than the missiles would have done. The Stingray special starts out by letting you see every enemy on the stage no matter where they are. When ready to attack, you shoot the beam of ink that shoots through walls to hit your opponent. When you land enough hits, you splat your opponent. However, when firing the Stingray up close to the opponent, if someone's up close to you, you're most likely going to lose the encounter due to your limited mobility. Ink Jet puts you in the air on a jetpack that shoots ink out the back. In the special, you fire large globs of ink that kill on impact to do splash damage depending on how close you are to hitting the enemy. You're vulnerable to ranged weapons and there's a pretty high skill ceiling for timing your shots and maneuvering the jet. The splashdown is a super simple special. Yeah, try saying that five times fast. I recorded that one line like three times. Hit the special button, you shoot into the air, you shoot down and hit the ground and ink splashes everywhere, and you kill everything in your radius. However, it is relatively easy to splat someone before they get up into the air and splash down. Ink armor is one of the most valuable specials in the game due to it protecting you from a few shots. It's not unbreakable like the bubbler, but it doesn't need to be with how OP the bubbler was. It gives both the user the chance to survive an encounter, and the attacker a chance to break the armor. Bomb Launcher in Splatoon 2 is literally the exact same thing as Bomb Rush was in Splatoon 1. That's it. So when Nintendo says that all Splatoon 2 special weapons are new, remember they're saying that on a technicality. The Ink Storm is a cloud of ink that drips down your team's ink. It does mild damage to your opponents over time and drips your ink onto the turf. It's good at putting your opponents into an uncomfortable situation, which can help you do things like claim a zone. It's not super strong, but it can get your opponents away from you or what you're trying to go towards. The Baller puts you into a giant hamster ball and basically turns you into a creeper. It's a good get out of jail free card if you want to activate it on time. It's pretty hard to get the jump on someone though with the Baller explosion, so that's why it's better of a get out of jail free card rather than as an attacking special. The Bubble Blower shoots out three bubbles that explode in your ink when you shoot them enough. They're very good at getting people out of a certain area because they know that when you shoot them enough, it's going to soon explode. The Booyah Bomb is a bomb that you can charge up with your teammates by spamming the Booyah button. When it's pressed enough, then you can throw a giant bomb wherever you want on the map, however you do have a little limited range where you can throw it. Also, when charging the Booyah Bomb, you get a really strong version of ink armor. It's also one of the best specials in the game. However, the funnest special, and the last special we're going to talk about today, is the Ultra Stamp. It is a giant hammer that you can smash down on the ground and smash everyone in your path. 
it leaves a big space of your ink in its path after you smash it down, and you can also throw it at your opponents. Only flaw with it is that the fact that it has so few weapons that actually have it in its kit, and some of the weapons that do have it are really nasty. So, I hope you picked up on how many times I said however when talking about Splatoon 2's special weapons, which is something Nintendo did to balance their weapons. It makes it easier to balance things than there are downsides like slower mobility or making yourself a big target. Specials, like it or not, in Splatoon 1 are not as good as they are in Splatoon 2, even though they are more overpowered. When fighting a special, it's a challenge, not a death sentence, and that's what it was in Splatoon 1, a death sentence. When using a special, it gives you the opportunity to learn how to balance your powers with the weaknesses that it gives you, which leads to Splatoon 2's weapons having a higher skill ceiling than Splatoon 1's. The overall Splatoon series doesn't actually have a ton of multiplayer modes, despite being a multiplayer focused game. It has 5 modes in total, Turf War, Splat Zones, Tower Control, Rainmaker, and Clan Blitz. Turf, Zones, Tower, and Rainmaker were all added in Splatoon 1. In case you're new to the series, I'll run through the modes real quick. Turf War. You shoot the ground, and the team with the most ink on the ground wins. Splat Zones. You hold one of two zones, and whoever holds the zones the longest wins. Tower Control. Someone stands on the tower, and when you're on the tower, it moves deeper into enemy territory to secure a win. The team that brings it deeper into the enemy's territory wins. Rainmaker. You shoot the Rainmaker bubble, and when the first team that pops it, they have their ink explode everywhere and it can kill your opponents around them. Then, when your team must bring the Rainmaker deep into enemy territory, while avoiding the enemy. Clam Blitz. You and your teammates must collect 10 clams to make a power clam. Once you get a power clam, you must go into the enemy territory and throw it at the enemy's power clam basket. The team that brings the most clams into the other enemy's basket wins. And you have to do all of that while preventing the enemy from doing the same thing to you. This was the only new mode added in Splatoon 2. And I'd say it's an acceptable amount because there's no precedent for doing something like this before. But adding a total of one new mode in a sequel is just kind of dumb. Like, if I don't want to play Clam Blitz, I can just go over to Splat 1 and play all the same modes that I do want to play. Considering that the community loves all the other modes more than they love Clam Blitz, this is really not a good thing for Splatoon 2. They should have added at least two modes to Splatoon 2. So in terms of multiplayer modes, while Splatoon 2 does have one more, it doesn't yell sequel like it should. It just mumbles it. Now, before we jump into multiplayer stages, I'd like to briefly talk about the Splatoon hub world, better known as Inkopolis Plaza and Inkopolis Square. Let's talk about Inkopolis Plaza first, because it's the first one that came out. Inkopolis Plaza is a big open hub world with lots of room to walk around. It has four stores in it that sell guns, hats, shirts, and shoes, which all function as your gear. You can also find Callie and Marie, who will wave to you if you stare at them long enough like the creep you are. Miiverse was also a thing at one point that would let people post in-game drawings, however that's been gone for a long time. Finally, the best feature in the plaza, overall in my opinion, were the arcade games that you can play. My and most people's favorite being Squid Jump. Moving over to Splatoon 2, we see a massive downgrade. Gone are all the bonus arcade modes, and in its place is the Shoal. The Shoal is a local multiplayer mode that lets you play multiplayer modes with people locally. Go figure. The square has five shops. Four of them sell the same things, guns and gear. But in Splatoon 2, there is a new shop, the Crust Bucket. This shop allows you to purchase food and drink items that boost staff gains, money gains, and XP gains. Pearl and Marina are also visible and will wave at you when you stare at them creepily. The square is really just one long line that leads you to the battle tower with everything you need to get to on your way to the tower. Really, the best one comes down to preference, but in my opinion, I'm not a fan of the minimalism and all the bonus arcade features being taken away. So the plaza, in my opinion, is the better hub world of Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2. So, multiplayer maps. They're arguably the most important thing in Splatoon. You've got to have a place to use all of those weapons you have. And this is where one thing that Splatoon 2 just goes downhill. Splatoon 1 had a total of 16 unique maps by the time its updates and support ended. Splatoon 2 had 14 maps at the end of its support. Splatoon 2 did, however, have more than this. 23 to be exact. 
However, nine of these were returning from Splatoon 1, and a good chunk of them weren't even good maps. Moray Towers, Kelp Dome, Camp Triggerfish, those aren't good maps. So in terms of map count, Splatoon 1's got Splatoon 2 beat, at least in new maps. But quality is better than quantity, and Splatoon 2 does have some absolute banger maps like Manta Maria, Mako Mart, and Muscle Forge Fitness. That's not to diss Splatoon 1's maps, because they did have some good ones too. The unforgettable Urchin Underpass, Flounder Heights, and the map that everyone seems to want to come back, Mahi Mahi Resort. And touching on Mahi Mahi, that brings up a topic of map creativity. Mahi Mahi had water levels that would rise and fall over time. Cramped Triggerfish, despite being a horrible map, had walls that would come down to make turf more accessible for your team. Platoon 2 doesn't have any time-based features. I don't know how you feel about these, but I thought these time-based features brought a new layer of depth for the stages. In my opinion, I think Splatoon 2 did casual stages a bit better. Maps like Gobi Arena are really good in Turf War, but in more competitive modes like Clam Blitz, they fall flat. To be totally honest, the Splatoon series really hasn't had a whole ton of iconic maps that have hooked me like other games have had iconic maps before. Like Blood Gulch from Halo, that's an iconic map from the series but the Splatoon series doesn't really have an iconic map yet. Closest thing to an iconic map we really have is Moray Towers, and that's not iconic in a good way. That's not to say that Splatoon stages haven't been creative. Actually, let's talk about some of the most creative stages now. We can't talk about stages in Splatoon 2 without talking about the most loved and hated of them all, Shifty Stations. A new Shifty Station was added once a month during every Splatfest, but the catch is though that these maps can only be playable during the Splatfest they were made for, besides 2 hours in the final fest. I want to run through each Shifty Station map, but I don't want to spend too much time doing it. So really good, good, meh, bad, and the original release of Cooking Mama Cookstar are going to be the ways I use to rate these maps. Also I'll show what Splatfest they were used for. Ready? Let's go. Wayside Cool, meh. The Secret of Splat. Cooking Mama Cookstar. Goose Sponge, bad. Windmill House on the Pearly, good. Fancy Spew, meh. Zone of Glass, bad. Cannon Fire Pearl, really good. The Bunker Games, good. Grappling Girl, good. Zappy Longshot, really, really good. If not the best, that is a fact and not an opinion. I don't care what you say, it is the best shifty station. A Swiftly Tilting Balance, Cooking Mama Cookstar. Sweet Valley Tentacles, confusing, but good. The Switches, meh. The Bouncing Twins, Cooking Mama Cookstar. Railway Chillin', good. Gusher Towers, good. The Maze Dasher, bad. Flutters in the Attic, really good. The Splat in Our Zones, good. The Ink is Spreading, bad. Bridge to Tennis Switchia, good. Chronicles of Rolonium, Cooking Mama Cookstar. Fueler in the Ashes, really good. And finally, MC Princess Diaries. The last two Shifty Stations are the most notable because they added back features from Splatoon 1. Fueler in the Ash is bringing back the rising and falling water levels that Splatoon 1's Mahi Mahi Resort had, and MC Princess Diaries are letting you use the Killer Whale. Now, despite some of the Shifty Stations being duds, the addition of Shifty Stations is still a major improvement for the next topic we'll talk about, because Shifty Stations is the reason that Splatoon 2 will win the next topic. When Splatoon was first announced as a game with an evolving world, Nintendo used Splatfest as the way to keep the Splatoon world evolving. Just in case you need a recap if you've never played one or haven't played one in a while, Splatfests are in-game events that split the community into two teams and lock them on these two teams for the duration of the Splatfest and until the Splatfest is over and a winner is decided. So, Splatfest and Splatoon 1 were not the most luxurious events. Splatfest lasted for around 24 hours and featured nighttime's versions of the stages. There's no change in the stages, it's just dark out. There was one Splatfest exclusive song, and finally, in Splatoon 1, there were 16 Splatfests. That's not really a ton of cool stuff in Splatoon 1 Splatfests, but that changes once we get into Splatoon 2. Splatoon 2 was ready to push Splatfests beyond their full potential. Originally, Splatfest and Splatoon 2 still lasted 24 hours, but that was later changed to 48 hours. Night mode stages were back and looked so much better than they did before. There were three new Splatfest exclusive songs, and finally, the Shifty Stations which we just talked about. There were 26 unique Splatfests, 3 Rewind Splatfests, and the Super Mario Splatfest that doesn't really deserve its own category because of how much it sucked. So, in all, Splatoon 2 had 26 real Splatfests during the course of its life. 
So Splatoon 2 really improves on Splatfest in every way, but we can't really talk about Splatfest without talking about their endings. So next up, let's talk about Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2's Final Fest. Splatoon 1 and Splatoon 2 both had Final Fests. These were the two biggest Splatfests of both games. What I plan to do here is just evaluate them both and pick a winner. And spoiler alert, one of them is going to be another by a long shot. Kelly vs. Murray took place from July 22nd to July 24th. It was the first Splatfest that lasted two days, which would eventually become a precedent for the Splatoon series. The Splatfest also added Calamari Incantation from the campaign as a song that plays during the Splatfest battles. Kelly Marie ended in a Marie victory, as it should have. Splatoon 2 very much surpassed Splatoon 1's Final Fest in quality. Actually, it, it just lapped Splatoon 1. Splatoon 2's Final Fest was Chaos vs. Order, and holy crap did Nintendo raise the stakes for this Splatfest. Nintendo added four pieces of new gear, made this apocalyptic version of Inkopolis Square, and gave Pearl and Marina new outfits. They added Shark Bites, Calamari Incantation, Ink Me Up, Splatoon 1 Splatfest Now or Never, a new remix Now or Never with the Squid Sisters and Oct the Hook, Fly Octo Fly, Ebb and Flow Octo, not to mention this badass Splatoon Splatfest trailer music. On top of everything we got, we also got to play on all the old shifty stations, only though it was two hours. They also let us use the Killer Whale again. Splatoon 2's Final Fest had Splatoon 1's beaten in every way. It's not even a competition how much better Splatoon 2's is. It's important to note that each Final Fest determined the next game's campaign. Splatoon 1's was Kali hunting, and Splatoon 3's is, uh, something to do with chaos. Splatoon 1 had a variety of extra smaller modes, however most of them were DLC, so we'll talk about those in the next section. It had a little mini games like Squid Jump, but also there was one larger mode, called Battle Dojo. And boy oh boy, let me tell you about Battle Dojo. Battle Dojo was an absolute mess. It was a mode that allowed two players to play at once. One on the gamepad, and one on the TV with a Wii U or Wii Classic controller. Before we talk about the mode itself, we have to talk about just how stupid and pathetic this two player system was. So all of the Classic and Pro controllers didn't have a gyroscope in them. The gyroscope is what gives you the ability to use motion controls. In Splatoon 2, being a big game that uses motion controls, you needed to give the other person some way to use motion controls. And what was Nintendo's idea of how to do this? Maybe make a new controller that has motion controls? Hell no, Nintendo straight up told people to tie a freaking Wii remote to their existing controller to use motion controls. They actually said, tie another controller to your controller. And if you can't see how wrong that is, then you might have some built-up Wii U era derangement syndrome. So outside of this absolute blunder, how did this mode play? Well, it was a mode, that's for sure, and that's basically all it's got going for it. So someone uses the gamepad and someone uses the TV, and they would compete against each other to pop balloons that show up around the map. Special weapons would also pop up, and you could use them to splat the opponent or splat balloons. And when the timer ran out, the winner who with the most balloons popped won. This mode wasn't really anything big. But if you want to see a real example of a game exclusive mode, let's jump over to Splatoon 2. Salmon Run is a mode introduced in Splatoon 2. You and three other players either play locally or online to defeat Salmonoids, who are basically the Salmon version of Inklings and Octolings. An individual Salmon Run consisted of three rounds, each 100 seconds long, with a small rest period in between. In each, the team's players would be tasked with defeating Salmonoids in a variety of ways, Boss Salmonoids are big Salmonoids with a required method to defeating each one. Salmon Run has five unique stages to play in that mode. Salmon Run also has had a major impact on the lore and also the players that have played it. The majority of players that have played this mode really do end up enjoying it. The enemies are fun to fight, the rewards are really good. Overall, it's a really solid mode, however, it certainly does have flaws. Number one, there's only three rounds. This gets inconvenient because an endless mode would be a lot better as it would allow us to skip the hassle of matchmaking and just play however many we want. And we could see how far we could go if we had this feature too. But the biggest feature is that Salmon Run isn't always available to play whenever you want. It's only available to be played every other day, I believe. 
Nintendo says it's to make Salmon Run feel more like a job that freelances people whenever they need help, but in practice, it just pisses people off because they can't play the game they want to play when they want to play it. But overall, Salmon Run is still a massive improvement to the previous game's exclusive modes, which gives another win to Splatoon 2 over Splatoon 1. DLC is a weird territory to track through, and the reason is Amiibo. For each game, they have Amiibo support. However, Splatoon 1 does Amiibo much better. When you use a Splatoon 1 Amiibo, you get Amiibo challenges, which gives you extra hero mode levels when you beat them, exclusive gear as well. You can also get more mini games like Squid Racer, Squid Beat, and Squid Ball. Also, just note, none of these are better than the original Squid Jump. Sorry, just kinda had to say it. Splatoon 2 does amiibo challenges differently. When you tap an amiibo, you start a path to unlock amiibo exclusive gear. You earn this gear when you play multiplayer. Splatoon 2 has more amiibo than Splatoon 1, but this doesn't really give you anything else besides new gear. No new levels to play through, no new mini games, so that means Splatoon 1 does kind of DLC better than Splatoon 2, but there's a really big reason I said kind of. Because in reality, Amiibo, they're kind of just Amiibo. Yeah, they give you some new content, but if we're talking just straight up paid downloadable content, then Splatoon 2 is going to beat Splatoon 1 in every match. Because A, Splatoon 1 didn't have any DLC, and because Splatoon 2 had Octo Expansion. Octo Expansion was a game changer for the Splatoon series. Truly, just a pivotal point. However, if it weren't for Octo Expansion, I would be more hesitant on saying Splatoon 2 is overall the better game. Not only did Octo Expansion add playable Octolings, it added the best campaign the Splatoon series has ever seen, the best OST Splatoon has ever seen, don't fight me on that, sorry I'm just saying it because it's true. They added a truly unique vaporwave aesthetic to the game, a predictable plot twist that still leaves you feeling surprised and scared, and the best final battle the series has seen. This one piece of single player DLC added so much to the Splatoon series. So much lore, so many well done levels, so much character development. Octo Expansion is a love letter to Splatoon 2 and builds well on the foundation that Splatoon 2 started. Octo Expansion adds around 80 new levels, which is like 50 more than Splatoon 2's original campaign had. Not to mention that these 80s levels are actually challenging. Octo Expansion was truly a breath of fresh air that the Splatoon series really needed, especially after Splatoon 2's launch. One of the other non-Nintendo games I play is Destiny 2, and if you know anything about the Destiny community, you'd know that they'd go on absolute witch hunts against the developers when they don't get what they want when they want it. Like, I've seen the community like actually tear into developers before when they don't get what they want. Now let me tell you, if the Splatoon community was anything like the Destiny community, Nintendo would have stopped making this series out of just pure spite. And I wanted to bring up this comparison between Destiny 2 and Splatoon 2, and that's because Splatoon 2, like Destiny 2, did not have a lot of content when the game came out. The only new mode in Splatoon 2 was Salmon Run. No Clam Blitz, no Octo Expansion size campaign. Hell, Splatoon 2 only launched with 6 new maps. That's actually unacceptable. But you know what's also unacceptable? Splatoon 1 launched with five freaking maps. Freaking five! Like seriously, Nintendo, how do you expect to launch a new IP and have it be successful with five maps? Like, it's honestly astonishing how Splatoon did as well as it did without just getting written off as an underwhelming mess. That's like saying you're launching a new Mario Kart game and only having one circuit to race on. It's absolutely ridiculous how little content these games had to launch with. Yeah, they add maps later, but they should start out with like 10 to 12 maps, not 5 to 6. Splatoon 2 did have a little more content than Splatoon 1, but either way, both of these starting content amounts were just ridiculous. So, I think we've just about wrapped up everything there is to talk about. So now, let's come to our conclusion. Is Splatoon 2 a good sequel? And my answer is... It is now, but it didn't used to be. When Splatoon 2 launched, there was a damn good reason people were calling Splatoon 2 Splatoon 1.5. With no new multiplayer modes, only 6 new stages, a lackluster new campaign, people had a damn good reason to be pissed. 
but after four major updates, one paid DLC, and 30 Splatfest, I am happy to say that Splatoon 2 is indeed a good sequel, and will probably go down as one of the best Splatoon games ever in the series, if not one of the greatest sequels Nintendo has ever made. Thank you for watching guys, if you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe or subscribe. Wow, did I really just say that? Consider subscribing, and if you have been a subscriber for a while and you're interested, consider becoming a channel member. Uh, yeah, this was a pretty big and long and hard project to make, that's what she said. Alright guys, I will see you later. Bye.